Okay. So I'm pleased to introduce uh, our uh, fourth uh, speaker of the, this kickoff uh, day, uh, Vladimir Vodvolsky. So Cedric already said a, a few words about you. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, for a couple of years, you're now an actor also in logic and uh, formalization of mathematics, especially at the foundational, uh, uh, about the foundational issue. And uh, you will uh, present this, uh, your uh, Univalent Foundation, uh, uh, and, uh, as it's written. Thank you, Hyuga. <laughs> Sorry for the emotion. Uh, thank you. Um, So let me, so I, my, my talk, um, well, maybe I should start by, uh, by saying something, uh, because we need some sort of a, a little interval, I think, between the previous talk and the next talk, <laughs> usually. <laughs> so uh, let me just say some few general words. And um, first of all, I, I would really like to thank the organizers of, um, of this uh, trimester. And, um, you know, and, and, and actually also Cedric, who is not here, and, uh, but um, I would like to thank him too for, um, for doing what he is doing. And um, I think we had very interesting selection of talks uh, earlier today. And I certainly have a lot of stuff in my head after those talks. So, um, and so yeah, unfortunately, I, I, I couldn't listen to your talk because I had to finish my slides. But so <laughs> you'll, you'll, you'll have to tell it to me in person sometime later. <laughs> um, so, so the idea of this, uh, of, of my, and, and so my um, uh, talk kind of consists of two halves. Uh, the first half is, um, is about univalent foundations in general. And um, the second half is more kind of a collection of little comments about, little kind of pointers to, to questions which I'm actually thinking about uh, currently. So, um, and what I've been seeing is, is a major, for me personally, um, topic of kind of development uh, over the last few months was was actually related to whole light and to the L LCF style uh, architecture. So um, when I was preparing my talk, I, I really kept it in mind that I want to explain things. I'm kind of want to explain things to somebody who who comes to me and asks me a question, okay, so I have this great proof assistant, can I implement uni some univalent ideas in the framework of this proof assistant? Um, wh what is the minimal um, requirement for that? So, um, starting from this perspective, um, let me say that one can express uh, the most important uh, I think in, in univalent foundations is, is how to uh, 
properly interpret the universe in, in um, a type theoretic universe, uh, how to interpret it mathematically. Um, there is much, um, m many right words were said about the importance of um, equality in univalent foundations. And indeed it, it is important, but um, that was um, not the most important thing when I was starting. So the main idea of the univalent foundations is how to interpret type theoretic universe mathematically. And um, for those who want to sort of connect uh, univalent foundations to, to some previous thinking, uh, a very useful paper to look at is a, a paper by Mackay, which is called First Order Logic with Dependent Sorts with Application to Category Theory. Uh, so again, this is for those of us who, who don't directly trust type theory, who didn't grow up uh, writing things in dependent type theory, but rather who, who grew up uh, knowing that first order logic is, is the thing which deserves, uh, uh, which, which can be trusted, and everything else is something which has to be checked with first order logic. Um, so um, I also grew up like that. I don't think like that anymore. But um, what was very helpful for me in, in getting from where I was to where I am is, is this paper of Mackay. And um, there he actually discusses what, uh, what should be foundation of mathematics for, um, for the kind of mathematics which is being done um, by many mathematicians today, like categorical abstract mathematics. And he even gives a name, invariant foundations. Um, he then writes the following. The universe of the invariant foundations is not clearly defined as yet. It should contain ana n categories for all natural ends. The totality of ana n categories with their morphism and so on will form an ana n plus one category. So, um, so he's basically saying that the universe of the invariant foundations should be uh, the infinity category of infinity categories if we um, quantize in n. Mm. Sorry, not quantize, go to the limit in n. Uh, and it is a very natural idea and it took me a lot of effort to, um, to recognize that it's wrong. And that really this was one of the key um, breakthrough points which I recall from developing univalent foundations. That no, we don't need categories. We only need group points in order to start developing the foundations. Categories are great, but categories are basically higher level analogs of partially ordered sets. And while partially ordered sets are also great, it's the sets which are fundamental. And partially ordered sets is just one of the possible structures which one can endow sets with. And the same is true here. Um, um, it's, it's groupoids or homotopy types which are fundamental and category structure is just one of the structures which a type can be endowed with. Um, and, and that was a very important breakthrough because unlike infinity categories, which we really still don't know how to define them properly, um, Infinity groupoids are relatively easy to understand uh, due to the uh, reversal, so taking in the opposite direction, an idea which, which Grothendieck um, contemplated sometime in, in the late 70s, early 80s. And this is a, a citation from his famous Eskiz Doom program. This was, by the way, he was, um, I don't know how many of you know this story, but he was, I think, working in Montpellier, in the University of Montpellier at that time, and he wanted to, and he wasn't doing mathematics for, for like maybe more than 10 years. And then he wanted to get, I mean, he was doing mathematics, but he was not officially doing mathematics. And he wanted to get back into doing mathematics officially, and so he submitted a proposal to CNRS, and he called it the Schizdom Program. And uh, the proposal was, was not funded. Um, and nevertheless, it, it is probably one of the most productive, in a sense. I mean, w one of the most fruitful uh, 
papers which one can find in, in the mathematics over the last 50 years. And so one of the great things was, I suppose, that probably CNRS had some sort of a limit on the number of pages which one could use. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so this, this whole thing is about 50 pages long. And uh, Grossendick had, I think, by that time, real problem with writing short things, sh short, short texts. And so, um, but this text is, is really uh, short and really full of, of uh, very deep insights, and, and that was one of them. Um, so, um, so then, because if, if we don't think anymore about n categories and think about n groupoids instead, then we can take the idea of Mackay and combine it with the idea of Grossendick taken in the uh, opposite direction instead of using infinity groupoids as models for homotopy type, one can say, hey, that this, we can also use homotopy types as models for infinity groupoids because we don't know how to define infinity groupoids properly. And then, uh, if we look back at Makaya's statement, we, we come to, to the conclusion that the universe of these invariant foundations should somehow be the infinity groupoid of all infinity groupoids, but it should also, it, it should correspond to some homotopy type. So there should be a homotopy type corresponding to infinity groupoid of infinity groupoids and their equivalences. And we know that homotopy types somehow correspond to, to topological spaces, or so they're not all that mysterious. We should be able to, to understand what it is. And this is a very concrete, somehow, homotopy type. Um, now, in fact, things are slightly uh, more um, slightly different here because uh, this this reasoning is done in the inconsistent uh, reasoning system in a system where there is a notion of set of all sets. We know that it's inconsistent, but it's extremely convenient for uh, for um, kind of um, creative reasoning because when we do the creative part of reasoning, no one forbids us to use inconsistent systems as long as when we um, as long as on the later stages we, we take care to, to check that our, the product of our creativity can actually be um, checked uh, in the framework of something which is consistent. So, um, in the framework of ZFC, which we still believe to be consistent, um, Reasoning becomes slightly more complex, so we cannot talk about infinity groupoid of all infinity groupoids. We should fix at least a couple of universes, such that the first universe is, is an element of the second, and then consider infinity groupoids in the first universe as an infinity groupoid in the second. And uh, so there should be some homotopy type, u of u0 in, in, in u1. But now things also, this also, gives us a hint, which we didn't have before. Because here we can see very, very clearly that it's actually not, um, not a so well-defined homotopy type, because it really depends on u0. And if we take u1 to be a large universe, there can be lots and lots and lots of smaller universes in it. So there would be lots and lots and lots of such, uh, of such homotopy types. And, and how do we I mean, how do we distinguish one from another? And if we want to find a homotopy theoretic um, characterization of this type, then we should take into account that what we're looking for is not unique. Um, so, in fact, it, it, what is true, however, is that the universes in, in, in set theory are kind of embedded into each other. So, um, so if we have two, uh, two such things, then any two such things would contain a common third such thing, which is in some sense embedded into it. So it's, it's not, so the whole object may not be very well defined, but it's defined up to going to, um, to a sub-object in a sense. Um, And then, uh, if we think about what, what at all can be said about this gadget, about this U, 
the only thing is that it, there is a canonical map over it, canonical family over it, <coughs> namely the, the tautological family, the family which takes a groupoid, uh, which takes a point of this, of this type uh, corresponding to, to a groupoid and, and assigns to it this, uh, this groupoid itself. So it, it, there should be some, some sort of a vibration over this, um, over this uh, homotopy type, some, some, some very, very canonical vibration. Um, and if we go back to the simplified reasoning system, where there is a set of all sets, then one can easily see that this vibration should be the universal vibration, kind of should be the fi vibration from which every other vibration can be induced in uh, exactly one way. Uh, now we see that if we go back into consistent system and, and think about uh, there not being a set of all sets but there being universes, then, uh, then what happens is that uh, the property that every vibration can be induced uh, disappears, but the property that in exactly one way, in, in no more than one way, remains. So one comes up with the observation that there is a vibration over this homotopy type which satisfies the uniqueness but not the existence property of universality. And um, so I started to look for a name for such things and, and I, I remember that in algebraic geometry, there is a notion of a versal vibration, or actually a versal map, like versal curve or something like that in modular space theory. So, so versal is something from which everything can be obtained by a pullback, but not necessarily in one way. And I, I needed something where it would be in no more than one way, but not necessarily anything. And so um, I was thinking and thinking, and then I came up with the, with the word univalent. And that's, that's how the name univalent appeared in, in univalent foundations. And there is a little uh, extension to the story of the name of univalent foundations. So univalent foundations, it's all about the universe. Uh, the fact that, that one can then interpret Identity type, I, even di I didn't even know about identity types when I was thinking about it. In fact, that was one of the uh, major kind of problems in my thinking that I didn't know about identity types. Later when I learned about, I mean, I, di I didn't know about uh, J eliminator approach to identity types. But, um, but certainly it um, was not a part of, of the main ideas of univalent foundations, which they were invented. So um, there is a little extension to this story and, and this is that there is this um, very important and interesting book by Boardman and Vogt called Homotopy Invariant Algebraic Structures on Topological Spaces. And when I started to, to look something in the Russian translation of this book, I discovered that the book was translated into Russian very long ago. It was probably I don't exactly remember when, but, but long ago, like before the Russian terminology uh, was um, sort of became, became stable. And, and so they had this unusual translation of the, of, of the term uh, faithful functor. It was translated as univalent functor. Nowadays it's not. Nowadays faithful functor is, is called uh, strict functor in, in, in Russian. But... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> But back then it was called univalent. And so uh, I also have this, this page. And, and here is where, where it says the functor is called univalent if and, and blah, blah, blah. So, uh, but, uh, but I guess there is some, some truth in that because um, this is sort of when it, this foundation started to, to, fall, um, to fall in place. I really felt that this, they're faithful to how mathematics is represented in my head. And uh, so, so univalent ideas, univalent foundations have now been used in, in at least two libraries of, are, are being used in at least two libraries of formalized mathematics in Coq. There is hot library, and there is something which actually 
Um, we haven't pu publicly announced yet, but uh, something which uh, myself, Dan Grayson, and ben Benedict uh, Ahrens uh, participate in, and it's called UniMass Library. It's, uh, so we have two um, largely independent in, in, in style developments of univalent foundations in Cork at the moment. Um, like Hot Library uses type classes, does it? <laughs> I don't even know. I haven't, I haven't looked much into it. Uh, so, so uni <laughs> no, I'm serious. Uh, that they, they, uh, they're doing it by themselves. And um, um, in UniMass, I'm using kind of very, very conservative cork. So I'm using, basically I'm using um, Martin Loew type theory as, as embedded into cork. Like I, I, I don't use inductive constructions other than the ones which are necessary for the, for the standard uh, constructions of Martin Loew type theory. Um, so there have also been very interesting um, very interesting activity in uh, the univalent direction um, based on uh, using AGDA. But it is my feeling of, of the developments of the last several months that uh, in order to move further in, in reaching my goal, which is the creation of um, proof assistance, which we mathematicians can actually use in our everyday work. Um, to, to, uh, to move mathematics ahead, not to, um, not to check things when they have already been done, but to use them as we are inventing things. Um, so it, it seems like the further progress in this direction uh, really requires um, us to find ways to collaborate with communities which are using other approaches to, um, to building proof assistance. And so one such collaboration seems to be approaching reality, as I wrote it here. Um, and um, this, maybe we can find some ways of, of um, of, of building an LCF style proof assistant which can um, be combined with univalent ideas. And um, this, this is where my thoughts are mostly at the moment. So uh, the rest of the slides are both technical and, 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 and much less philosophical in a sense, well, in a sense. We'll see. So and they're also incomplete. So, so the, at, at the very end, this, everything will be almost completely open-ended, because that's that's where sort of that's where my thoughts are. So, what does one need to have in a type theoretic proof system in order to express the main ideas of univalent foundations? Just what what is the, mini, the the bare minimum which one needs? So the bare minimum are these three things. One does not, strictly speaking, need to have identity types. Um, in fact, my very first writing about, um, about this stuff was, was about how to define identity types from universes. Um, and I, th that direction have not been explored much, but But these this, uh, three components are necessary, and that obviously means um, dependent, uh, dependent types. So dependent types are, are crucial. So do we need a sequence of embedded universes in order to, to do univalent foundations? And so yes, if we're looking for a consistent system. No, if we don't care about formal consistency. And um, I would like to... Um, advocate that um, this, that we need to, to be able to distinguish between um, tasks where we need formal consistency 
and tasks where we don't need formal consistency. And, and there are both. Um, in, the, in the tasks which are related to the exploration of the space of all possible kind of proof assistance and of in the development of new proof assistance, I think there, there are many arguments for, 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 ma for, for making kind of uh, test, test systems which don't, uh, which don't care about uh, formal consistency too much. Uh, for example, uh, okay, and, and sorry, uh, not for example, uh, some, something else which is very important. So um, another thing is that univalence is, is a rather fundamental thing which, uh, which grew up from the experience of large direction of modern mathematics. So it's, um, it's, it's, it's really a fundamental achievement of, of modern mathematics that, that we understand that not everything is a set and that we, not only we understand that not everything is a set, but we understand in which way, at least one way in which it's not a set and, and how it can be, um, how this uh, negative statement can be turned into a productive positive statement. So, for various reasons, we do want to have, to, to, at least we want to explore the possibility and, and the designs of univalent programming languages. Um, now, programming languages, the ones which, which are actually usable for, for everyday tasks, are as deduction systems inconsistent, because one can write their um, non-terminating programs. And um, that means that, and, and there is absolutely no reason why, um, why would we need, uh, why, why univalent, ideas of univalence cannot be uh, um, successfully combined with, with ideas from uh, programming languages. Um, which are not necessarily, sorry, which are not necessarily consistent. So, so that, that's, that's another reason why it's important to, um, to experiment with various combinations of univalence with inconsistency. Um, so a more, a more basic simple example is, is of course the uh, type and type assumption. The type, m making a type and type assumption makes things enormously less complicated from the point of view of implementation. So one, one immediately doesn't need to care about um, a, a big kind of overhead of this, of the universe management, which, um, which is extremely important and interesting, but it's not really relevant for many other problems which we want to, which we want to study. So um, in, in studying in learning about various approaches to inconsistency in such systems is in itself a very interesting um, activity. So, another um, side of things which have been showing up a lot recently uh, is the issue of um, inconsistency which arises from dependent matching. And, um, the issue of, in particular, inconsistency which arises from the combination of certain types of dependent matching with certain types of univalence, such as um, propositional extensionality. Um, these are, this is something else which which I think can be explored in, in various uh, productive uh, ways, but I, I really know very little about it because uh, I, don't, I don't have a good understanding of, um, I do understand what is U in U, what does it mean to have a set of all sets and where, where it can lead us astray, but I don't understand what it means to have dependent, 
pattern matching and where that can lead us astray. So that's for, uh, for us to explore. So this relates to the ongoing controversy in, in, about the, um, well, termination checking or whatever you would call it, uh, the issue of, of how, to, how to properly um, deal with um, inductive constructions in, in Coke and Agda. And the suggestion which comes to mind here is not to, not to try to find uh, the correct uh, solution because it may take many years to find one or there may not be one, there may be many. And um, we shouldn't kind of stall ourselves uh, by such a, um, by, by such a restriction. So it would be great to have several modes in Coq, uh, where one could have one mode, for example, with, um, which I, I called here slow mode, because such a thing, in such a mode, the computation would be slow, um, or, or maybe writing things would be slower, I don't know. But, but to have several, um, several modes open and to have them well characterized in a sense that one should have a, it's, it shouldn't be some, some kind of a flag and which, which just makes something to work by, by, by some magic. Th this mode should be, should be clearly defined, clearly documented, uh, clearly explained, but then one should be, user should be given um, an you know, option to use different ones in, and experiment and, and then we can all learn something. Uh, of course, all of that requires manpower and uh, probably more than anything else. And I think that's where all of us need to think about somehow contributing. Not necessarily, I don't mean time necessarily, but maybe some influence and money. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, at least, again, I, I, was, I, I, I told you in advance, that that's, that's, I'm going to talk about what's in my head uh, at the second half of the lecture. So that's in my head in, in particular. That, um, that I think the development of Coq in particular been, have been kind of slower than it could have been lately um, because of the resources. And purely kind of basic resources which are, which are in, in, in huge abundance over there in the world. Um, So, so I'm also seeing the LCF style approach as, as kind of a, um, this idea of embedding consistent system into an inconsistent system taking, taken to, um, in, in a kind of more serious way because in an LCF style approach one embeds a consistent, well, a system which we believe to be consistent. So um, formal deduction system such as something like Church type theory uh, into a bigger system which we know to be inconsistent which is in that case a, a camel in the case of coal light. Or of coal light. And, um, but does it in such, a, in such a way that this ambient inconsistent system can be used to produce re reliable results in the uh, in the framework of the consistent system. And, and this is very, um, somehow very right. Um, and so in, in the case of whole light, this idea of a slow mode and, and fast mode, it's roughly speaking, I mean, whole light in itself is, is not in any practical way um, constructive, but if it were, um, then the slow mode would be the type system itself and the fast mode would be um, the ambient or common. So the same, um, this, this issue of uh, non-terminating computation arises uh, in, in a kind of almost um, mandatory way when we start thinking about adding a second equality, uh, something which have been and I hope will be a subject of um, further development 
somehow in, in univalence there is this un univalent equality, which is very dem demonstrably uh, non-extensional non in a sense. It's, 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 uh, word extensional here is not very mm, convenient, but it's, it's an equality where you cannot you cannot use it to simply um, substitute one term for another. You have to use an explicit transport function in order to do that. Um, so, uh, and on the other hand, it's clear for in, in many, many um, tasks which a mathematician faces that um, even when mathematician is, is thinking about these higher level objects and, and uh, high, not about sets but about um, um, homotopy types of higher level, it's very important to have, to be able to use some sort of a strict equality in the process. But when wants to use it, and we now know of some ways to use it, which doesn't end endanger um, the invariance under equivalences. But, um, so this, this is not that much of a problem uh, with, with strict equality. Uh, the problem is that uh, so this is just to introduce, but I mean, I, I need some term. I don't want to say extensional, so I was saying substitutional. So substitutional, if, if it has this, uh, this rule that if you have, if type T1 equals T2 in that substitutional sense, and, and T is, is a member of T1, then the same T is a member of T2. Um, all right, so that's, that's, Judgmental equality. Well, it, it need not be judgmental, though. Um, it, it, it's it's uh, and, and, and this all these different um, properties of equality are better not not to be mixed up. This is precisely the property which uh, which is needed, and um, I'm um, so I, I'm calling it substitutional. In part because if you have two two objects, uh, or one or two and you have a type depending on an object, then you can replace O1 by O2 without changing the objects of the, of, of, of the type. So, now, as soon as we have substitutional identity types, we automatically have non-terminating computation. And this is very easy to prove, very easy to show, because we, one can have T, a type, then I can have an identity between T and functions from T to T, and then I can write the standard uh, non-normalizable uh, non lambda term, and it will be well typed. So uh, substitutional equality, which can be put into the context, implies necessarily uh, um, that one um, can have uh, that one will have non-terminating computation, and so. If we want one, we should be ready to deal with the other. Uh, and the last thing, which I, that's my last slide. Uh, as you can see, there isn't much written there, but I know that, we, uh, that many people are, are also concerned with the fact that univariate foundations seem to be um, kind of prohibiting the use of, of a strict prop, and, and that many people are really fond of strict prop and probably for a good reason. And, uh, and I, I was just going to say that I very much recognize this fact. <laughs> and, um, and I'm sure that we can, it's a little bit like the strict equality. Uh, it's something which looks a little alien at first, but I'm sure we can um, find a way to, to keep it. And to keep it in, in the right way. Um, so I think that that's the end of uh, my slides for today. Thank you very much. Didn't you give a very good uh, reason yourself ag against the rule that you propose that if uh, two types uh, which are elements of a universe U 
capital T1 and capital T2 are um, identical in the universe, then you may pass from uh, little t being of type capital T1 to little t being of type capital T2. Uh, I mean the, uh, then you made further suggestions which seem to me cast a great doubt on the um, on it being a good idea to to have that rule. Well, let's let's if we look at things from a practical perspective, it's it might be true that every uh, computation in Coq, for example, let's terminate, but it's a purely theoretical uh, theoretical fact, even if it's true. Because it's, it's so, so easy to write a computation in Coq, which will <coughs> probably not terminate in your lifetime, even if you want to do it provably. So, uh, and and there, it, it's much easier to write a computation in Coq for which you will have no idea whether it terminates or not uh, in, in, in any reasonable amount of time. So for practical use, so I'm thinking that what we need is, is a proof system where every verifiable proof is correct. Uh, and, uh, and there are enough verifiable proofs to prove, uh, to verifiably prove many things which we want to have to prove. But there may be correct proofs which are not verifiable. And that's sort of okay. And so that would mean that we have a, f that, that there, that, that, that's what practically is the case. That, that sometimes one writes a proof in Coq and then one gets to define, for example, and, and then the thing hangs and then one thinks that instead of waiting for it, I'll, I'll better just change my proof. So I, in, in the case of Coq, it's mostly due to, um, to, um, to things which can be eliminated and probably should. But um, it's nevertheless, it's, it's, it's practically, it's okay, I think, if one can write uh, um, a well-formed uh, sentence, I mean, uh, let, let's say a, a well-typed object for which the checker will, um, will not be able to check that it's well-formed. Um, as long as the opposite doesn't happen, as long as we know that if everything which the checker can check as being well formed is actually well formed, and um, <sighs> no, no. I mean, Gödel teaches us that we have to make compromises. <laughs> But, but the idea of types is that uh, you don't need to run the proofs. They, they exist just because they are well typed. So uh, if, you, if you consider a proof that's based on a non-terminating program, it's you, you allow for Madoff kind of, uh, of you know, borrowing the proof in the future and never paying your, your debt. Well, there is a difference between uh, running proofs, as you call them proofs, are between normalizing objects and verifying that the objects are well typed. Mm. And um, no one is, suppose I write an object which is 2 to the power, 2 to the power, 2 to the power, 2 to the power 10. No one is, I mean with, with the brackets, parentheses put, put in the right way. No one is going to wait until it normalizes. But it's easy to check that it's well timed. And um, so that, that's my. Just one little rem. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just one little remark. I mean, I have to press the button. 
Yeah. Are you see other one? Brilliant, thanks. Yeah, I mean, you, you sort of gave the impression, maybe it was my misunderstanding, that uh, the feature that you have can construct terms which do not normalize uh, do lead to logical inconsistency. That's definitely not the case, uh, because what you were suggesting was essentially extensional type theory, and all those non-syntactic models of type theory studied before, uh, yeah, there were the simplicial sets models and the like were models for uh, extensional type theory, which actually were based on untyped programming languages where uh, you have uh, a general recursion and thus non-termination. Because this example you showed rather says that in an inconsistent context, which is non-empty, you can have morally non-open uh, open terms which, we, we, which may loop, but uh, that does not lead at all to inconsistency. So, in, in, in short... I mean, what uh, you call inconsistency? Is that every type is inhibited? Yeah, yeah. So all the realizability models, I mean, which uh, validate uh, extensional type theory, and uh, sure, uh, you can have this phenomenon here, they have general recursion, but you see, the existence of uh, diverging terms yeah, does not conflict with consistency. I mean, the first models of system F constructed, well, well, tools, brush, yeah, I don't know, uh, were with partial equivalence relations on natural numbers. We're just using this first Kleene algebra, which is a somewhat unpleasant, but but it's definitely a model of untyped computation. Now, the, uh, the implication here, which I'm being a little kind of lax with, is uh, going in the opposite direction. If um, in the systems which we are working with, um, an object of an empty type is necessarily not normalized. So, in that sense, inconsistency implies non-termination. But not the other way around. Uh, that's right, that's what I'm saying. The implication is, I'm, I'm being lax with it on purpose here, because I um, just wanted to connect various things together. Other question? So somehow I have a question. Uh, so it, so I, I don't know why you want to have uh, this extensional type theory, but uh, um, why not to have the, the rules that you expect, that if two types are uh, provably equal, uh, then they are convertible, only when you have a, a close proof of this equality. So that you cannot you you cannot have the example uh, you show you are in a, where you are in an inconsistent con context and get uh, and get a loop. If uh, if you accept if you take only provable uh, equality between types as convertible provable with the closed uh, terms, then assuming you have a model, of course, uh, then you you wouldn't get. Uh, non-termination. Um, I, I, I don't. I'm, I'm not sure that I can answer your question mm. uh, uh, well at, at the moment because it's something I, I, I would need to think about. But I, I would think that it would not give us. For example, I would want to have r to the one plus n to be the same as r to the n plus one. <coughs> But this is typically provable by a close proof. One, the commutativity of addition is provable inside the system. You don't have to no, assume it. No, but the it. n itself is, yes. is in the context. Yes, but uh, it's in it's in an uh, inhabited type. It's not in an empty type. But how do you know which type is, is empty and which is not? Y yes, of course, you need the syntactic criterion 
to, uh, but at least for some type, you are able to say if it's inhibit, inhibited, even if you cannot decide it in general. Well, I, maybe. I, 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 I'm, maybe one can, but my idea here is, is to be sort of more daring and uh, um, and, and just, just if we think like that, and it works, because like I think, when, when I think, I, I, I think about a set of all sets, and it does not, uh, doesn't prevent me from, from coming up with, with, uh, with correct ideas, mm -hmm. as long as I verify them later. So why not to give this option to, to our proof systems also? Yes, I don't know. This I don't Something know. Something like that. I mean, from a practical point of view, uh, you don't lose the decidability of type changing, for instance. The what? The decidability from of, of type decidability of type changing. But anyway. Right. That, that's what I call ver verifying the correctness mm. of proofs. Like, yeah. Okay. Other questions? Mm. But it, it, let me just. But make one comment. It is not difficult to have a system where one would be able to close and open these loopholes in the process. And, and one can do a first kind of go on a proof with, with some loopholes open and then, um, then work on, on filling them up. And, and, and the important thing is that, that I can have a flag which I can easily turn on and off which will give me a mechanical way of verification of which of the uh, assumptions have been used. After all, I'm, I, I don't believe in the consistency of piano arithmetic. I don't. And I, I, think, it's, it's, I think it's plain inconsistent. And uh, nevertheless, I'm, I'm using it all the time. And, uh, and so um, the important, <laughs> important thing is that um, That we sort of don't restrict ourselves. Okay. Unnecessary. <laughs> okay. So maybe I, I suggest we continue this uh, yeah. this design decision, design discussion on a proof assistant on the foundation uh, at the at the cocktail uh, outside the, the room. So thanks again. Yeah.